James K. White Mystery of the Sea by Bram Stoker Chapter 28 Voices in the Dark I looked round the cave with mingled feelings. The place itself was, as a natural wonder, superb, but to me, as a treasure hunter, it was a disappointment. In no way did it answer the description of Don de Escoban. However, I did not despair. There were many openings, and some one of them might bring me to the required spot. I passed to the center of the cavern and looked round. As I did so, I got a momentary fright, for several of the openings were so much alike that only for my rope I would not have been able to distinguish that by which I had come in. The lesson of this shock should not be lost. I must make a mark by which I could distinguish this entrance from the others. No matter where the other openings might lead to, this alone, so far as I could tell, was the one which could lead me to safety. With a heavy pebble I hammered away at the right side of the entrance till I had chipped off a piece of rock. I could tell this place again by sight or by touch. Then I went round the cave examining the various branches. It was here that I began to feel the disadvantage of my imperfect light. I wanted some kind of torch which would give sufficient light to see the whole place at once. One could get no fit idea of proportion by merely making the little patch of dim light from the bicycle lamp travel along the rocky walls. I felt that all this time Marjorie must be anxious about me, doubly so since she had no clue to where I had gone. So I determined to come back at once and postpone the thorough examination of the place until I should have proper appliances. Accordingly, I made my way back to the place where Marjorie anxiously awaited me. Her reception of me was sweet and tender. It was so natural that its force was hardly manifest. It may have been that my mind was so full of many things that I did not receive her caress with the same singleness of devotion as was my wont. Now that I was assured of her love for me, and since I had called her my wife, my love lost its element of anxiety. It is this security which marks the difference of a husband's love from that of a lover. Doubt is an element of passion, but not of true conjugal love. It was only afterwards, when I was alone, and Marjorie's enchanting presence was not with me, that I began to realize through the lenses of memory and imagination the full sweetness of my wife's greeting and her joy at the assurance of my safety. It took a very few moments to tell her all the details of my adventure, and of the conclusion which I had come to as to the need for postponement. She thoroughly agreed with me in the necessity, and we then and there settled that it would be wiser for her to go back to Crom tonight. We were to settle later, when all preparations had been made, when we should again attempt the investigation of the cave. When I had put on dry clothes, we set out for Crom. We walked our bicycles past Winifold and were grateful for the unique peculiarity of that village, an absence of dogs. We did not light our lamps till we got on the Peterhead Road, and we put them out when we got into the mesh of crossroads near Crom. In the wood, Marjorie once more resumed her footman's coat, and we set out for the castle. On our way we had agreed that it would be best to try the other side of the castle, where it was not likely that any stranger would attempt to approach, as there was only the mossy foot-track through the wood by the old chapel. In the later days both Marjorie and I had used our opportunities of finding new paths through the wood round the castle, and we had already marked down several tracks which we could follow even in the dark, with a little care. This was almost a necessity, as we had noticed of late, traces of the watchers round the main gateway through which all in the castle were accustomed to come and go. The path which we took tonight required a long detour of the wood, as it lay right on the other side from the entrance gate. It was only a narrow grass path beginning between two big trees which stood closely together not very far from one of the flanking mounds or hillocks which here came closer down to the castle than any of the others. 
the path wound in and out among the tree trunks till finally it debouched at the back of the old chapel which stood on a rising rock hidden in the wood some three hundred feet from the west side of the castle it was a very old chapel partly in ruins and antedating the castle by so many centuries that it was manifestly a relic of the older castle on whose site crom was built it may have been used for service early in the sixteenth century but it could not even have been in repair or even weatherproof for there were breaches at the end of it in which had taken root seedlings which were now forest trees there was one old oak whose girth and whose gnarled appearance could not have been achieved within two centuries not merely the roots but the very trunk and branches had pushed aside the great stones which lay firmly and massively across the long low windows peculiar to the place these windows were mere longitudinal slits in the wall a sort of organized interstices between great masses of stone each of the three on either side of the chapel was about two feet high and some six feet in length one stone support irregularly placed broke the length of each there was some kind of superstition amongst the servants regarding this place none of them would under any circumstances go near it at night and not even in daytime if they could decently excuse themselves in front of the chapel the way was very much wider originally there had been a clear space leading through the wood but centuries of neglect had done their work from fallen pine cone and beech mast and acorn here and there a tree had grown which now made the original broad alleyway a number of tortuous paths between the towering trunks one of the reasons why we had determined to use this path was that it was noiseless grass and moss and rusty heaps of pine needles betrayed no footfall with care one could come and go unheard if once she could get through the wood unnoticed marjorie might steal up to the doorway in the shadow of the castle and let herself in unobserved we went hand in hand slowly and cautiously hardly daring to breathe and after a time that seemed endless came out at the back of the chapel then we stole quietly along by the southern wall as we passed the first window marjorie who was ahead of me stopped and gripped my hand so hard that i knew there must be some good cause for her agitation she pressed back so that we both stood away from the window opening which we could just see dimly outlined on the granite wall the black vacancy showing against the lichen-covered stone putting her lips close to my ear she whispered there are people there i heard them talking my blood began to run cold in an instant all the danger in which marjorie stood rushed back upon me of late we had been immune from trouble so that danger which we did not know of seemed to stand far off but now the place and the hour the very reputation of the old chapel all sent back in a flood the fearful imaginings which had assailed me since first i had known of the plot against marjorie instinctively my first act was to draw my wife close to me and hold her tight even in that moment it was a joy to me to feel that she let herself come willingly for a few moments we stood silent with our hearts beating together then she whispered to me again we must listen we may perhaps find out who they are and what they intend accordingly we drew again close to the opening marjorie standing under the aperture and i beside it as i found i could hear better in this position the stooping made the coursing of my own blood sound in my ears the voice which we first heard was a strong one for even when toned to a whisper it was resonant as well as harsh and raucous then it settled we wait till we get word from whiskey tommy how long is it likely to be the answering voice also a whisper was smooth and oily but penetrating can't say he has to square the duchy and they take a lot of sugar his kind they're mighty pious when they're right end up but lordy when they're down they're holy terrors 
This one is a peach. But he's clever. I will say that, and he knows it. I'm almost sorry we took him in now, though he is so clever. He'd better mind out, though, for none of us love him. And if he goes back on us, or does not come up to the mark... He stopped, and the sentence was finished by a click which I knew was the snapping of the spring of a bowie knife when it is thrown open. And quite right, too. I'm on, if need be. And there was another click. The answering voice was strong and resolute, but somehow, for all the wicked intent spoken, it did not sound so evil as the other. I looked at Marjorie and saw through the darkness that her eyes were blazing. My heart leaped again. The old pioneer spirit was awake in her, and somehow my dread for her was not the same. She drew close to me and whispered again, Be ready to get behind the trees at the back. I hear them rising. She was evidently right, for now the voices were easier to hear since the mouths of the speakers were level with the window. A voice, a new one, said, We must get now. Them boys of Max will be on their round soon. With a quick movement, Marjorie doubled under the window and came to me. She whispered as before, Let us get behind trees in front. We may see them coming through the door, and it will be well to know them. So, motioning to her to go on the side we were on, I slipped round the back and, turning by the other side of the chapel and taking care to duck under the windows, hid myself behind one of the great oak trees in front, to the north of the original clearing. From where I stood I could see Marjorie behind a tree across the glade. From where we were we could see anyone who left the chapel, for one or other of us commanded the windows, and we both commanded the ruined doorway. We waited, and waited, and waited afraid to stir hand or foot, lest we should give a warning to our foes. The time seemed interminable, but no one came out, and we waited on, not daring to stir. Presently I became conscious of two forms stealing between the trees up towards the chapel. I glided further round behind my sheltering tree, and, throwing an anxious glance toward Marjorie, was rejoiced to see that she was doing the same. Closer and closer the two forms came. There was not the faintest sound from them. Approaching the doorway from either side, they peered in, listened, and then stole into the darkness between the tree trunks which marked the breach in the wall. I ventured out and slipped behind a tree somewhat nearer. Marjorie, on her side, did the same. And at last we stood behind the two nearest trees and could both note the doorway and each of us the windows on one side. Then there was a whisper from within. Somehow I expected to hear a pistol shot, or to see a rush of men out through the jagged black of the doorway. Still nothing happened. Then a match was struck within. In the flash I could see the face of the man who had made the light, the keen-eyed messenger of Sam Adams. He held up the light, and to our amazement we could see that, except for the two men whom we had seen go in, the chapel was empty. Marjorie flitted over to me and whispered, Don't be afraid. Men who light up like that aren't likely to stumble over us, if we are decently careful. She was right. The two men, seeing that the place was empty, seemed to cast aside their caution. They came out without much listening, stole behind the chapel, and set off along the narrow pathway through the wood. Marjorie whispered to me, Now is the chance to get in before they come back. You may come with me to the edge of the wood. When I get in, dear, go back home as fast as you can. You must be tired and want rest. Come tomorrow as soon as you can. We have lots to talk over. That chapel must be seen, to. There is some mystery there which is bigger than anything we have struck yet. It's no use going into it now. It wants time and thinking over. We were whispering as we walked along, still keeping carefully in the shadow of the trees. 
Behind the last tree Marjorie kissed me. It was her own act, and as impulsively I clasped her tight in my arms, she nestled in to me as though she felt that she belonged there. With a mutual good night and a whispered blessing, she stole away into the shadow. I saw her reach the door and disappear through it. I went back to Cruden with my mind in a whirl of thoughts and feelings. Amongst them love was first, with all the unspeakable joy which comes with love that is returned. I felt that I had a right to call Marjorie my very own now. Our dangers and hopes and sympathies made a tie which seemed even closer than that tied in the church at Carlisle. End of section 28 Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista